Ben Frazier is the chief investment officer of Aspen Funds. He's the co-host of the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast. He is an alternative investment thought leader. Welcome to the show, Ben. Hey, thanks, George. Looking forward to chatting. Yeah, excited to have you on. Tell us a little about your personal life, some more about your work and why you do what you do. Yeah, we were just talking before we hit record button. Um, I got four girls, uh, 10 and under, and a uh, crazy life, but they are a big reason of what I do, what I do. And, um, you know, the business side of things, so yeah, I'm the, the CIO of Aspen Funds, and we are a, a private alternative fund manager. And so we um, invest in, you know, private alternatives, uh, mostly in real estate, but also in oil and gas, a variety of different strategies. And, uh, you know, my journey into that is a little bit unique. I didn't necessarily start in real estate. It was actually a commercial banker. I was an underwriter for several years. And, one of the cool things of doing that was getting to look under the hood of these very successful high net worth, you know, borrowers of this bank. It's kind of a boutique bank, you know, lent to a lot of high net worth uh, businesses and individuals. And so got to kind of see their personal financial statements, their tax returns as part of the underwriting process. And as I started doing that over several years, really got to see this common thread um, across some of the most successful, you know, borrowers of the bank. And those studs were generally, they were business owners, and they were real estate investors and had you know heavy allocations in both of those um, areas. And so it really kind of was eye-opening to me and really start us uh, you know started the journey of wanting to get into um one of the entrepreneurship side of things, but also the investing side outside of the public markets. And so we can talk a little bit about that if you want, but um, it's really kind of started this journey. It's kind of what our whole podcast is about. Invest like a billionaire is actually, you know, using a lot of the strategies and techniques and, you know, allocations that the ultra wealthy are using and applying those at a smaller scale, kind of our individual portfolios, um, which generally include heavy investment into alternative investments. So that's kind of the the, the short story of how we got to where we are Um but it's I love what I do, and so it's it's uh, every day is is new and exciting and different, and have an amazing team that's been really fun to build. Nice. How much longer are we going to call what you do alternative investing? Why isn't it just regular investing? <laughs> yeah, you know it's it's funny because if you look at how much capital is deployed into these kind of private equity investments, right? It's kind of an alluring title, but it kind of encompasses anything outside of the public markets, right? So we have public and private. I, I think forget what the number was last year. I think it was something like $3 trillion were invested in private markets, you know, in, in real estate and private equity. Um, and so it's a massive, massive place where capital is placed. The ultra wealthy, the endowments, the institutional investors have been investing in this uh, really since the 19... You know, 60s, 70s, they started making pretty big allocations here. And, um, you know, Yale Endowment was one of the pioneers uh, from the endowment side to to kind of eschew the normal uh, traditional approach of just investing mostly in, you know, public equities and did a lot of things in the private markets because they saw inefficiencies and generally have inefficiencies and, you know, inefficient markets, you can produce, you know, outsized returns. And so, that's what they were able to do. They outperformed their benchmarks for I forget how many decades. So it kind of caught a mainstream at the higher institutional level, but never really caught on at the retail level. And I think part of it is, you know, not that I'm a conspiracy theorist at all, but the kind of main street, um, you know, financial advising system, if you want to call it that, it's set up where it's it's pretty dialed in is pretty simple. You can, you know, buy the S&P and get exposure to that pretty quickly. And there's a lot of advantages to it. And a lot of financial advisors, they're just paid and incentivized on, you know, asset gathering, not thinking outside the box, not thinking creatively. It's just how much, you know, AUM can I gather? There's nothing wrong with that, you know, inherently, but inevitably, if everyone's doing the same thing, you know, you're probably leaving something on the table when you, when you're, um, you know, not zigging when everyone else is zagging. And so I think it's it's kind of opened up a whole new world because in 2012, uh, the Jobs Act um, actually created some new regulations that allowed a lot of these investments to be open to a much wider audience, you know, through accredited investors. And so that's that's really made this huge shift. We continue to see, you know, a lot of data we talk about in our podcast that's um, capital continues to flow in greater and greater measures toward the kind of private markets because they're seeing a lot of advantages, you know, from 
uh, the public market. So not to throw all your eggs in that basket because there still is um, wisdom and balance, right? And exposure to, to multiple asset classes and public and private, but there's definitely some advantages uh, to the private market investments. So the Yale endowment has been doing it for a, a long time and has been getting these outsized returns for a long time. And there's $3 trillion in this space. So the advantages are. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's pretty simple, honestly. Um, there's a survey done of financial advisors, actually. So people that generally aren't super incentivized to allocate capital here, because one, you got to think about, they get paid a percentage of their total assets under management. Well, when you go and invest in private market investments, private alternatives, it's generally not considered under your management. So you can't collect your fees on it. So there actually there is some of a conflict of interest there, but there are advisors that are starting to change how they're structuring their fees and they actually are trying to create a more holistic approach. And these advisors, they're, they're the survey that was done recently, there, there's two key things. One is better diversification when you invest across private markets and two, better returns. I mean, those are the the, the two simple reasons why people do it. And the, the simple answer of why those are the case, the public markets over the past several decades have become more and more highly correlated, right? So the the traditional 60-40 portfolio, you know, used to have some nice balance, you know, as if the equities are doing good, bonds maybe aren't doing as good and vice versa. And maybe you add some REITs in there for some exposure to real estate. Maybe you add some commodities, other things. But the problems are as, as the economy and really the the uh the large um uh you know NASDAQ SP, these big indexes have become so uh, kind of, they're made up mostly of a very few small number of companies from a market cap standpoint. The correlations between all these assets have gotten a lot closer. Meaning if the you know public equities are down, tech, tech is down, most of the markets are down, right? And vice versa, if they're up, most markets are up. And we actually saw, I think last year, the 60-40 portfolio had the worst performance um, that it's had in over a hundred years. And part of that is because of correlations. And so if you think about true diversification, you're not getting the same diversification you used to have when you had stocks, bonds, you know, REITs, and um, commodities as you used to. And so you have to go outside of the public markets to get other diversification that is going to create some more balance in your portfolio. So that's really one of the main reasons, right, is, is true diversification, which is a way to preserve wealth. That's one of the, you know, I think it was Charlie Munger who said there's there's no such thing as a free lunch except diversification is about as free as you can get because you are creating, um, you know, uh, wealth preservation by doing that. And the other is is better risk adjusted returns. When you go private, um, you can usually find and invest in niches that have, you know, inefficient markets. And whenever there's inefficient markets, that's where you can kind of capture a premium on your returns. And so those are kind of the two, the two big drivers. Nice. I appreciate that. So how are you different than the REIT or the the real estate mutual fund that shows up in somebody's 401k? Yeah, great, great question. Because most people would think, oh, I'm invested in real estate. I have some REIT holdings and I've been invested in REIT. And not to say that you're not, but they're they're very, very different. And what a lot of people don't don't understand when you invest in a REIT you're actually investing in a stock that owns a company that owns some real estate, right? And you're not necessarily investing directly in the real estate. And there are some key advantages to investing directly in the real estate, which we'll touch on in a minute. But the other thing that people don't realize is the liquidity premium that you're paying for these publicly traded REITs, in my opinion, is way too expensive. So what do I mean by that? The liquidity premium is I'm willing to pay a little bit more to be able to buy and sell my shares in this REIT um, whenever I want, right? So that's liquidity. And, that, and the big downside of private markets is illiquidity generally, right? You can't just sell whenever you want. You're usually in these investments for many years usually. Um, but when you invest, if you go look at what's called the price to book ratio, right? This is similar to a price to earnings ratio. People are probably familiar with the, the PE ratio. Price to book is great for asset-based businesses or investments because the book is the the 
the, the value of the assets on the balance sheet, right? So for real estate, that's what's the value of the current value of the assets that you own. So the price to book is the multiple above that, 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 that stock is trading at. So if you look and you, you know, look at the price to book of the top REITs, generally there's going to be a range of anywhere from, from three to 10 X, right? So that means on a 10 X, for example, on the high end of this, for every dollar that you invest in that REIT, only 10 cents of that is actually going into the real estate. Hmm. So what's the other other 90 cents? Well, it's it's that premium you're paying for. So I would argue it's probably not worth uh, paying that premium on the real estate um, just to have the ability to sell if needed. Now, that's why you know, portfolio allocation and management is important here. So you have you know, um, some cash, you have some public equities, so you can have access if you need it to. And then you can generally get higher returns through illiquidity, right? Which is kind of a mis- or uh, people are, doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but if you can actually um, invest in something that you can't touch when it's a bad time to sell, which as emotional investors, we generally tend to do that sometimes, it actually can be a, a buffer against bad decision-making, right? So it can actually help you ride out some of those, those bumps. So that, that's the biggest difference. When you invest directly into real estate, usually my price to book is pretty close to one, right? There's probably a little bit of fees on the front end, but pretty much 95% of your dollars going into real estate. And then when you directly own the real estate, you get a lot of tax advantages. So you get depreciation that gets passed through. Um, and you can take that against other passive gains when you have passive losses. And so you can really get really tax efficient Um when you are investing directly into real assets. And so there's a lot of, a lot of advantages and a lot of kind of, you know, bunny trails to go down on that, but at, at a high level, those are the big differences. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's a, a great way to put it. That liquidity premium, that makes a lot of sense. As a chief investment officer, what, how do you, how do you section out your time? What does a typical day look like? Yeah. Yeah. I have a uh, four, four departments that report to me. So um, we have kind of our underwriting and deal flow. We're always looking at new deals, trying to evaluate what kind of deals we want to look at and what are going to be the standards that we expect them to to meet before we invest in a deal. Um, and then we have the asset management. So these are deals that we've you know already purchased and are managing through the business plan that we've established for them and help, helping them hit their targets. And then our marketing team and our, our investor relations team um, are also reporting to me. So it's trying to shift my brain lots of different places throughout throughout the day and the week. But um, that, that's part of the fun of my job too. Yeah, I appreciate that. So how many funds do y'all have? We have, I'd probably say 12 to 15 funds active right now. And a lot of them are, are not open for new investment. These are kind of legacy funds that we continue to operate. Um, but we usually do a couple a year. And so, um, yeah, we're kind of always kind of rolling out new funds. And what are some of those criteria? You say, okay, it's we're coming up on 2024. You probably have your plans made, but just down down the road, 2025, how do you decide, okay, do we go regional? Do we go like number of doors? Walk me through that whole process. Yeah. So our investment thesis is a little bit different than a lot of operators. And the way that we kind of create the directional kind of focus of our investments is through what we call investable megatrends. And so we're very, very focused on the economic trends. We do a lot of research um, internally on kind of where we think the economy is going and where different asset classes are going. And so the cool thing for us is we're not a hammer and everything is a nail, right? We're not just in one asset class and we have to make this work regardless of the economic or asset class cycle that it's in. We can really shift and be agile to where we think the opportunities are. And so um, we kind of do our, you know, state of the union kind of analysis on multiple asset classes. And then we kind of decide where we think the best risk adjusted opportunities are going to be. And then we kind of use that to dictate the strategies that we're going to go after. And we usually like these things to be driven by what we call, you know, mega trends. So they're not just these kind of short kind of parts of the cycle. We can time a cycle really well. We want to, you know, invest in long-term fundamental drivers of growth in a variety of different asset classes. So for example, one of our kind of key asset classes in the 2024 is industrial real estate. It's been on a great, great run for a long time. We actually think we're about to hit a phase two boom in industrial. And the first phase was caused largely by e-commerce. 
uh, which continues to grow, but it's starting to plateau, right? E-commerce sales as a percent of total retail sales has started to kind of plateau. Um, so we still think there's growth there, but what's really driving this next wave of growth is really a second boom in manufacturing and reshoring inventory kind of in this post COVID world. And so there are already kind of these indications before COVID of we would almost over globalized in a sense to where we'd shipped out so many jobs, we shipped out, you know, all these parts of the supply chain and we started creating um, external risks that we didn't really understand until COVID exposed them all, right? We all remember the days of trying to go buy something at Lowe's or wherever it was. And, oh, we have supply chain problems, right? That kind of became a, a funny meme because everything was stuck on the supply chain somewhere. Well, it's really caused a lot of companies to shift how they are you know, rethinking the supply chain. You know, Critical components in the manufacturing process are being brought back to the U.S. And um, it's kind of the other side of this too is the the outsourcing of jobs has uh, really become less and less economical over time. Um, you know, if China, for example, the wages to average laborers have increased 15 fold in just the past two decades. Hmm. And so the cost to manufacture, bringing it back to the US actually isn't um, as expensive as it used to be relative to other places. And so that's, that's what's really driving a lot of this kind of next boom. We're seeing this a lot. So that's, that's kind of how we think, it, again, an example of how we think about um, the investment things we go after and where we're positioning uh, as, as investors. Which, from a common sense perspective, makes a lot of sense that you'd want to pursue these mega trends versus, oh, this quarter, interest rates are going to go up a little bit, but we don't know what's going to happen next quarter. That seems like a, a bad idea to be pursuing short-term things. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we kind of like, and we, um, you know, we say economic tides versus the economic waves, right. Mm. And so much of the public markets kind of just go up and down based on these waves. What's, what's the fed meeting going to say, what's the fed going to say with interest rates, right. And the whole market's just holding on to see, try and pull out a few words of what Jerome Powell says and try to interpret, you know, his decision-making. Well, we don't know necessarily what's going to happen in interest rates of the next couple of months, maybe the next couple of quarters, but we, we know probably over, the next couple of years, the direction that those are going to go, they're probably going to go down at some point, right? And so if we know kind of long-term directional information, we can make positions and strategies that can benefit from those kind of directions. And they don't have to be, uh, they don't succumb to the ups and downs of the short-term decision-making cycle. Because that usually, you know, it, it changes so much. And it's um, a lot of times the markets are irrational. And, you know, so we want to, buy into something and build into something that is going to have a long-term thesis behind it. So that regardless of what the timing is in the short term, we know long-term that that, that strategy is going to win out and then we can, you know, exit and, and, you know, usually sell these properties when it makes the most sense. Love it. Well, Ben, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you? Somebody was so inclined. How do they invest with Aspen funds? Yeah, we have our podcast um, called invest like a billionaire you can check that out, some of our economic themes. And then, uh, yeah, our private equity firm is aspenfunds.us. You can go on there and check out current offerings. Excellent. Well, if you enjoyed this much as I did, show Ben your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Check out the Invest Like a Billionaire podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts and go to aspenfunds.us and dig deeper into what Ben and I have been talking about today. Thanks again, Ben. Hey, thanks, George. Until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best.